Hello, everyone, and welcome into the Go 24-7 podcast. Uh, different areas, different parts of the country, we could even say. Uh, Glenn, this, that's Glenn West, by the way. My name is Bryce Kuhn. We picked, you were joking about it, two, just, we, we picked the day just to say, let's just go home, get ready for the holidays. Uh, we thought we were going to enjoy a nice little quiet Christmas. And, um, you know, Mike Denbrock had to end up, you know, taking the Notre Dame job. Good for him. Excited for he and his family to be closer to home. But for us, uh, man, we're, we're recording in different locations. Glenn's on his LTE. I'm on a little bit of shaky Wi-Fi. So stick with us here as uh, as we as we roll in this podcast. But Glenn, I mean, at what point did you hear the news? Had you left for New Orleans yet or not? No. So thank uh, thank God that we were uh, you know yesterday or no, it was probably two days ago now. So we're recording this on uh, Saturday morning. Um, so on Thursday afternoon, evening, um, you know, we started to hear some some mm-hmm. rumblings about the the strong connection with Denbrock and, and Notre Dame and, uh, you know, just wanted to play it safe. So I woke up you know, early, early Friday morning and got a, a story ready just in case something happened. Wasn't really expecting it to happen that quickly uh, because really about five, ten minutes after I put it in the system, the news breaks and. Um, you know, we, we, we source and confirm it ourselves and, uh, we're, yeah, we're, we're, and then we're ready to hit publish. So, um, you know, it was, I think it came together all pretty quickly. I'm sure LSU kind of had an inkling, uh, maybe the day before, um, that something like this was going to happen. So, uh, you know, I think Denbrock told him this, this, uh, you know, Friday morning officially that he was off to, off to Notre Dame and now LSU, um, you know, I think we kind of knew coming into the off season that, um, you know, their, their offensive coaches were going to be hot commodities. Um, we just weren't sure which ones were going to leave, which ones were going to stay. And, you know, it seemed, or certainly seems like Denbrock's name was, uh, was, was, was thrown around, not just by, uh, you know, his connection with Notre Dame, but, you know, Texas A&M reportedly threw a big bag at him and uh, LSU was able to get him to stay. And, you know, we can go into a little bit more of the behind the scenes and our workings of why uh, Notre Dame makes more sense for him and why he should, or why he wanted to go back up north, where he's kind of got a lot of family and spent a lot of his career um, up there. So, um, but you know, the, this is this is a loss. I mean, we're, we're not going to sit here and sugarcoat the fact that you know losing your offensive coordinator of the number one offense in the country and was obviously a big part of the brains behind the operation. Um, that is definitely a loss for LSU. That you know, but why you know that Brian Kelly is going to have to 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 fill and. Um, but you know, at the same time, this is also why you brought Brian Kelly in here. He is, he is, he is, um, you know, been widely regarded as a great CEO in terms of his hirings and, uh, the assistant coaches that he's brought in over the past, uh, you know, 20, 30 years of his career. Um, and so that'll be tested for sure. Uh, this go around, uh, we thought it might, you know, uh, you know, we thought it would have to come certainly on the defensive side of the ball and we're, we're still waiting to see if the, that kind of change is on the way. But um, certainly now on the offensive side of the ball, they're going to have to do some restructuring here uh, after losing Denbrock, and it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw this in because Glenn said I had to throw it in. We were driving back to Georgia. We get on Interstate 12. I decide I'm going to take a doze off for a little nap. And I wake up to my wife, you know, bumping my shoulder from the uh, from the driver's seat. She goes, "Hey, I just got the ESPN notification that LSU lost a coach or something. You might want to check that out." So I immediately got on my phone. You, you and Sonny had been texting about. It. I was like, "Oh, let me hop in here real quick because I think I just said like, wow." And then like tried to start like catching up on you know obviously kind of what happened uh, from that little you know six hour drive that we had back to Georgia. But no, look, we talk about LSU losing Mike Denbrock to Notre Dame. I mean. Glenn, when you really look at it, Denbrock, I believe his his hometown, his family, they, they're all about two hours away from South Bend, Indiana. I mean, it, it makes sense when you talk about a guy that is, you know, uh, I guess we'll say it the, the the correct way, longer in the tooth. Uh, he's a little bit older, maybe looking to get closer back to family. I don't know if Denbrock's looking for a head coaching job at this stage in his career. So it makes sense to go back to Notre Dame in a place where, you know, look, they've struggled with some quarterback development. Uh, they've struggled with, you know, offensive explosion, even in this year, having a guy like Sam Hartman. They got to have him a guy, Marcus Freeman, who's recruiting really well. And I think it's a chance to go back home. I'll be honest with you. I saw a lot of ruthless fans that were, you know, uh, mad, upset. It's a loss for LSU. But I think from a personal and a business decision for, you know, Mike Denbrock, it, it makes sense. Like to, to go back closer to home, 
And, you know, LSU fans might not like this one too much. You're still coaching at one of the premier brands in college football. And it's a chance for him to kind of, you know, uh, continue yeah, to, to ride out his career where he's going. I'm not saying he's going there to end his career, but I'm saying this is a chance for him to get right. closer to home on maybe on the back end of his career. Yeah, and, and look, he spent two different stints at Notre Dame. I mean, he was there from, I believe it was 2002 to 2004, and then again uh, under Brian Kelly from 2010 to 2017. Um, so he's very familiar with the area, very familiar of the recruiting and just kind of how it works up there. I mean, you know, that we – yeah, they, they've 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 done a little bit better job, I think, of recruiting in the last couple of years. But we, you know, it's 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 no uh, no secret that you know a big part of their you know pitch to recruits is you know you got to be pretty sound academically, and you know we 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 want to have a guy that knows how to uh, recruit to those uh, standards as well. So um, yeah, look, I, I think it makes sense on a lot of different levels for Denbrock to leave. I think if he was going to leave for a lateral move like this. Uh, taking a job like that would have been the most would, would make the most sense and not really maybe the the big bag thrown at him from an A&M or something like that. Now, he is going to be paid handsomely by by Notre Dame. I, I do believe that he's going to be one of the higher paid, uh, if not the highest paid uh, coordinator out there uh, in college football. So, you know, it, it's. It, it's you know look I think we can get back to it from an LSU perspective but I think it is a loss because what has Brian Kelly preached for you know this better part of the last month and a half two months is look we want to have some continuity here we want to be returning a lot of our our mm -hmm. personnel and our players and um, you know getting that level of development and buy-in um, from from those guys and I think that extends to the coaching staff to some degree as well especially on the offensive side of the ball where you've really taken some big steps. Uh, from year one to year two in terms of your evolution of the offense and uh, the scheme and how you want to, you know, run things going forward. So, um, you know, losing a big piece like that is certainly not something that's easy to overcome. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what he does here. You know, we've got a couple of uh, you know, young coaches and I'm sure we'll get into here in a minute that have an opportunity in front of them to, to really seize. And, um, but, you know, I, I think just from a, you know, putting a, uh, maybe a, a, a wrapping paper over the Denbrock angle of all this, Ooh. you know, Christmas, Christmas time wrapping paper. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's a loss, but it's one that I think LSU can overcome with the right uh, decisions. And, you know, they, they've got the, the guy in place that is supposed to be able to make those and, and has shown over his career that he can do it at a pretty successful rate. You know, you're not going to be batting a hunt, uh, you know, a thousand on every decision, but, at least from the offensive side of the ball, Brian Kelly, at least here at LSU, has proven that he knows ball and he knows how to you know, bring in coaches that are really good offensive players or offensive minds. I love that, Glenn. I use that all the time. It's it's just a guy that knows ball. I mean, he's been doing it for so long. Like I said, he's not going to bat a thousand on this, uh, but man, he he does pretty well over the course of his career. Great segue into you know, I guess Glenn, the, the announcement came out what maybe forty five minutes an hour afterwards from um, you know from the, uh, the you might LSU have been up from your nap by then. You might have been up from your I think nap I was. By then. I think I was. Yeah, yeah, I think I was able to get that email from uh, Michael Barnett. You know that, that talked about Cortez Hankton and Joe Sloan are going to be co OCs. You know, obviously those guys are going to be heavily involved in the passing game, and then Brad Davis and Frank Wilson are, are going to kind of you know meet together for the run game. I will say this, Glenn. You know, this is kind of uh, – we haven't come out with a hot board yet. Sonny's working diligently on putting that together. When you look at the internal option, and this is always a battle during coaching changes. I know you've covered coaching changes, obviously, at LSU. I've covered coaching changes elsewhere. There's the battle of the fan base. Do we stay in-house or do we get fresh blood from elsewhere? With the way that LSU's offensive scheme, the continuity aspect, it would seem – Joe Sloan might be the perfect fit to kind of, you know, just, uh, you know, migrate from the quarterback coach's position uh, to OC where he can still be heavily involved in the development of those quarterback coaches. I, I don't know, man, because when I just – I thought about this, you know, first off, I said, man, Joe Sloan would be a great fit. One, that helps you give him a raise, a better title, and keep him, you know, as an LSU Tiger. But two, when they announced, like, the interim offensive coordinator staff, I was like, I don't know if there's a better situation of guys to have around you to help with that graduation from a quarterback coach. Frank Wilson in the in the years of experience. Brad Davis, we know he's a great recruiter, but a great developer. Uh, Cortez Hankton, a really good receivers coach. Like the people that would surround Joe Sloan to me to help make him a great OC. I don't know if there's a better 
you mentioned continuity for them to go. I'm not inside the building, but I wanted your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I think you bring up a lot of really good points. You know, I think I'll probably add to it by saying that um, you know, Joe Sloan was sitting right next to Mike Denbrock the last two years while he was calling plays as the OC um, up in the booth. So he has that uh, experience, at least from, from just watching and, and kind of communicating with Denbrock about how to go about calling a good game plan, um, you know, scripting plays and, and doing all that stuff. And, and going back to his days at Louisiana Tech, I mean, he was there for nine years and he had a big, big hand in play calling. I believe he actually yeah. uh, called plays for a, a short stint there. I can't remember exactly when. Uh, maybe it was right before he came to LSU. But so he, he has some of that experience, I think, in his back pocket. And certainly, I think, sitting up in the booth with Joe, uh, with Mike Denbrock the last couple of years has maybe helped evol- you know, you know, evolve that aspect of his coaching background. And um, it'll be very interesting. I think these next couple of weeks and certainly how the team performs uh, in the bowl game is going to be big for him and certainly for Cortez Hankton. Um, you know, Hankton was uh, or has been a coach that's been on the field uh, the last – couple mm-hmm. of years it'll be interesting to see if maybe he uh, gravitates to the booth next to joe sloan and they kind of split the play calling duties up that way or maybe he stays on the field and kind of has more of a hands-on approach uh, on the field it'll be very interesting to see how they kind of use that dynamic because i do think that these are both guys that eventually want to be offensive coordinators um and you know i think this is a good kind of uh, I think yeah, the piece that we're running this morning here, I, I put it as a good test or uh, you know a good audition mm-hmm. maybe for for those yeah. two to kind of see if they can't work together and see if they can't um, you know uh, see if they they can't do this thing and, and, and make sure and make make the decision a little bit easier on Brian Kelly in terms of already having somebody in the building. Uh, what that would absolutely do is continue the continuity aspect of things. You know, keeping the rest of this staff relatively intact and. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of people in the building that have already done a really good job of getting this offense to where it is, uh, continuing mm-hmm. to evolve it. Um, and and you mentioned guys like Frank Wilson and 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 certainly Brad Davis and and Brian Kelly is always going to have a hand in the offensive decision making. But I'll even throw it to the personnel side of things. I mean, look, you're if you're Joe Sloan and Cortez Hankton, you're going to have pretty much everybody available to you except Jaden Daniels. I mean, you're going to have your entire yeah. roster on the offensive side of the ball coming back. I mean, Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas are going to be playing in this game. Um, you know, you're going to have a, all your entire starting offensive line with Charles Turner, and you know he's already you know declared that he's going to go to the draft and go to the, uh, one of the senior bowl games. So having that continuity and having a lot of carryover and not having a bunch of guys opt out of the bowl game I think should really add a layer of uh, comfort level for, for, for Sloan and for Hankton as they kind of – try to navigate this thing but I absolutely think that if you know they they have a good performance here in the next couple weeks and uh, have a good game uh, a good game plan and good execution on on, on the first that will absolutely be a big factor in whether or not um, Kelly wants to make this thing an internal hire or 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 go outside and make another um, you know bring in another OC to kind of help run things but regardless I think one of the biggest things you have to do is be able to retain the rest of your staff um, yeah. you know, the, 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 just, 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 just to make sure that you have some continuity and some carryover in from what was a historic 2023. So, um, I know that it's, uh, it's a big deal for them to kind of, you know, see if they can't get an extension done for some of these guys, Joe Sloan and, and certainly Hankton and, uh, you know, Frank Wilson, a lot of these guys are going into the final year of their contracts. I think the, um, the one that you want to get done sooner than later is, is certainly Sloan, but also, um, a guy like Brad Davis, who was here for a year uh, before then, and I think I think they yeah. might have redone Brad Davis's contract last year. I think kind of how they work is they go every three years or every two years before you get to that last year of your contract. They kind of want to renegotiate and, yeah. and restructure it just so you're here for longer. You don't want to go into the final year of a contract with no extension. So um, you know that'll it'll all be something to keep an eye on as LSU and Brian Kelly make these decisions now. Um, and, and, but I, I, you know, just to answer the question, yes, I do think Joe Sloan would be a good fit. Uh, I think, uh, Cortez Hankton, um, you know, would, would, would do well with some added responsibilities as well. I mean, even if it's not, yeah. uh, as a OC role, maybe he, they, maybe they find some other kind of title or something to give him that makes it more of a promotion and not, uh, really kind of staying still or staying the course of what he's currently doing right now. So, yeah, I think it would make a lot of sense to go an internal, 
uh, promotion with this uh, with this hire. Yeah, I think it'd make a lot of sense as we, uh, you mentioned, put the wrapping paper. I'll say put a bow on this topic, uh, staying with that Christmas uh, gift theme. You know, I, we're, I'm not trying to sit here and, and make a public announcement that, you know, Joe Sloan or Cortez Hinkins is the leading candidate. Just yeah. being around Brian Kelly for the past year, knowing how important to him it is to keep continuity in the in the day and age of college football that we're in, it just wouldn't surprise me if there is a and, – and there probably already has been. I mean, all, we have to be honest with ourselves – the public just learned about this over the past week or so this could happen. I guarantee you Brian Kelly has had an eye. If Denbrock leaves, how much do I trust this guy, you know, a guy like Joe Slender Hankton? And he's been vetting that throughout the course of the season. So the process that he – I'll say this, I always use this um, synonym here, or this scenario, the runway that, you know, the fans see might seem like, oh, it might be a rush decision. The runway that Brian Kelly has, you know, been working with to, to get a gauge on these guys, to vet them, uh, has been longer. And then you mentioned outside sources. I mean, Brian Kelly has coached 30 years as a head coach in college football. His network of coaches that he could bring in would be something interesting. But I do agree with you. I, I think it makes the most sense to look internal, uh, but we'll see. We'll see, obviously, in that bowl game, like you mentioned, great word for it there, Glenn, a good audition. Wanted to get to the final topic before we wrap it up here is, and I think there's, you know, a lot of debate going on our our message board about this, is the impact on LSU's offense. You know, a lot of times when this happens, fans like to say, oh, it's not a big deal. You know, Joe Sloan was really the mastermind. Look, I, I think it's a combination. There's a reason Mike Denbrock was up for the Broyles Award, you know, there in December and almost won the award. Uh, Joe Sloan's a great quarterback coach. Garrett Nussmeyer said uh, in a media availability on Thursday, you know, that his conversations with Sloan when he got to LSU were some of the best conversations that have helped him understand football and, and a larger scheme. That's a coach's kid talking, you know, glowing reviews about Sloan. But Denbrock did some great things. So I don't expect this offense, whoever is at the helm, to look much different because Brian Kelly is that CEO type. He's an offensive-minded guy. Uh, but your thoughts on this about, about where, you know, where this offense can go in, in look 2023 was historical. That's a pretty high bar to meet year in year out. But yeah. you know how you feel about this? Yeah, that was going to be my first thing. Is like you know, I don't want to say there's going to be regression, but there's there's not going to be a uh, you know a complete like consistency with what you saw this year. I mean, what Jaden Daniels did, what this offense had with Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas and how those three in particular were able to really elevate their games and uh, lead LSU's offense to, to a really historic run. Um, that would be a little bit, you know, uh, high thinking to think that would happen again. Um, so, yeah. you know, I, I think there was always going to be some kind of uh, kind of, I'm, I'm trying to avoid the word regression, but just kind of a, 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 a you know, a, reverting back to the mean kind of deal yeah um, yeah man, i'm real. i was really struggling with that man i just had no <laughs> idea to say other than regression but uh reverting back to the mean i think is a, a more polite way of putting it but um yeah I, I, which which i still think you can have you know a very successful season a very successful offense um with nussmeyer back there with um, certainly with a lot of the weapons they have returning and you know it's going to look a little bit different you know that was one of the questions i had for for Garrett uh, in player interviews this week was, you know, Hey, how do you think this thing's going to look? And, you know, he kept it pretty close to the vest, pretty tight lipped. He didn't give us a whole lot in terms of, um, you know, just, just from, from their play styles, you would imagine that it's going to be a little bit more, um, you, know, you know, shots down the field kind of, you know, was something yeah. that Garrett loves to do, which is, you know, push the ball down the field, which is something that Jaden really came into his own and in doing this year. And I'm not saying that that's not something that um, he, he didn't want to do or didn't do. He did it at a very historic level. Um, but this is definitely a part of Garrett's game that is woven into uh, the fabric of who he is. Um, he's going to want to get the ball out to his receivers. He's going to want to get the ball out to his playmakers and let them uh, go make the plays for him. Uh, I think, Probably the biggest thing that I'm going to be keeping an eye on with Garrett is the short and intermediate route accuracy. Um, you know, mm -hmm. just, just making sure that you can, because that's always been the question, right? With him is like, you know, yes, he can hit the big play. Yes, he can take those chances, and he's aggressive in taking those chances. But what about taking just like the first down play, like the the, the quick five yard yeah. route, the quick five, seven, eight, nine yard route that gets you maybe. Some big yards after the catch maybe it doesn't but it continues moving the chains continues moving the offense forward that's the thing that I really want to see uh, Nussmeyer take that next big step in doing um, you know we didn't see a whole lot of opportunity for him to do that this year uh, when he was thrust into that Alabama game in the fourth quarter when you're down two scores and you got to make something happen 
very similar to what happened last year in the SEC championship game when they were down 25, 30 points, whatever it was at halftime. Uh, you, you, you thrust him in there to try to make something happen after Jaden Daniels goes down. So it's it's been very similar situations the last couple of years, and he's shown us flashes of the player that he can be in those situations. But I, I think it's going to be a great opportunity for him uh, to have three weeks to prepare for a game as a starter. He talked about it with us on Thursday that, um, you know, this is an opportunity for me. Look, I can go out there and I can make mistakes. Like I can make mistakes and I can learn yeah. from them. I can re-rep, I can re-rep it again uh, because I'm a starter and I can make sure that we're getting it locked down and loaded uh, and ready for, for game time. Uh, and not have to worry about coming off the field when I miss a, you know, when I miss a play or make a mistake or something. Mm. So uh, they're looking to him to be that kind of dude. Um, and I, I think the fact that you saw Brian Kelly say that Joe Sloan and, and Cortez are going to be the the two guys that are going to, um, you know, kind of lead the offense in terms of play calling. Well, what are those two guys the helms of? It's the passing game, and it's of Gary yeah. Nussmeyer, who is, uh, you know, who 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 is going to be really uh, thrown into the fire here in his first game. So I think that, that, that this decision from Kelly, um, I don't want to say more than anything, but definitely uh, was a contributing factor to the fact that you have a new starting quarterback in here, that you have um, you know a guy in Nussmeyer who has not taken a, a, you know, a ton of snaps this year. And I think the fact that you're promoting, or at least for this one game, those two coaches that have worked as closely with him in the passing game as possible uh, should tell you all you need to know about kind of the direction LSU wants to go in this game. I think they want to feature Garrett Nussmeyer. They want to feature uh, Malik mm-hmm. Neighbors and Brian Thomas for however long they play. Um, and then we'll see just kind of what happens, you know, kind of in, in terms of filler and what who, who, who kind of explodes in the game, you know, once it gets there. But um, I think there's an added layer of intrigue here to this game now in terms of how yeah. you look at the future of this LSU offense and um, and certainly the, the future of the program with a lot of these young guys getting some opportunities. Yeah, I agree with you. And just to kind of piggyback what you were saying, you know, to, to begin with th- this one of the best things you could say, and you know, you mentioned regression and, and you mentioned reverting back to the mean, like this offense with what they're going to bring back, even without neighbors and, and obviously potentially Brian Thomas, you're going to have a essentially a Joe Moore award finalist offensive line protecting Gary Nussmeyer. He talked about that. Uh, you're going to have, you know, a really good running back room. Uh, you had kind of hinted, you feel like this is a group that might lean on the run game a little bit more next year in early parts of the season. I think that this is an offense that was otherworldly in 2023. They're just going to kind of come back down to earth. Does that still mean yeah. you can be a top 10, top 15 unit in the country? Yeah. Yes. They were just number one in about every statistical category this year. So yeah. I, I do agree with you. You know, it, it, look, it's just a luxury, I guess, and fans have been spoiled to have, you know, in the past five years, two otherworldly offenses that you it are hard to recreate. Uh, but no, I, look, I think this offense, I like what you said, this bowl game and this offense. There was, there, you know, the intrigue of bowl games has declined over the past couple of years with opt outs and things like that. And, you know, there was already certain levels of things that you could watch in this game. But now I feel like a lot of LSU fans are going to say, hey, we got to watch this game. I want to see what this looks like, you know, with these guys calling plays, see what Garrett Nussmeyer looks like. I, I, I'm excited to watch it. And uh, Glenn's going to have great coverage down there in Tampa. But hey, this has been a great podcast talking about this. Glenn, I appreciate you uh, being so willing to, uh, you know, wake up on a Saturday been- before your. You're off the Christmas holidays. For for those who are going to be watching on YouTube, I've been fighting the sun here at, at where I'm staying at my uh, grandmother's house in New Orleans. The sun just keeps kind of shifting. There's a lot of mirrors and a lot of windows and stuff. So um, sorry if half my face looks like the, the character from Dark Knight where it's half light and half dark, but that's just kind of the hand I was dealt here. So, um, but yeah, no, happy holidays to everybody. Um, you know, we've got you know, a lot of you know, good coverage coming up from the bowl game. We'll certainly keep our ears to the ground on, uh, you know, any o- offensive or defensive coaching staff changes that may come. And, um, but yeah, just everybody and have a joy, joyous, you know, holiday season. And, uh, we'll, we'll catch you guys back here pretty soon. Yeah. Can't wait to talk with you. Bowl game coming up. Uh, obviously the January signing period transfer portal never stops. Great time for you to jump on that 60% off deal we have over at go 24 seven. Uh, make sure you sign up link down below here, whether you're listening on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast or here on YouTube as well. We hope you have a great Christmas here. Bryce Coon, Glenn West, and uh, I'm sure, sure. Sunny ship. Hope you have a great Christmas as well. Uh, this has been the go 24 seven podcast.